Genshin Impact has had me and my wallet under its spell for a really long time now. So much so that it's kind of eating into my backlog. But I've spent a lot of quiet nights in Tavat for one really big reason. The game has a way of sucking you into it, and it gets you invested in all the nations it takes place in and all the stories within. Genshin is brimming with dozens of unique characters with their own lives, hopes, and dreams. Everything in my experience so far has been memorable because of that, and those are the reasons why I keep coming back to it every night after work. But there's one specific character that I feel challenged everything the game stood for up until that point, and continues to be the most memorable part of Genshin for me. In the isolated land of Inazuma, the God of Thunder rules with an iron fist. <laughs> She goes by many names, but her enemies and her people know her as the almighty Raiden Shogun. Raiden is a woman so focused on her own ambitions that she would completely obliterate anything standing in her way, even you. In my humble opinion, I think Raiden is one of the most important characters in Genshin Impact, and there is so much more to her than meets the eye. She signaled a very big paradigm shift in the overarching story and her actions have long-lasting repercussions that we are still seeing today. I think she's an excellent case study on how the game sets up player expectations through a ton of different ways and then delivers on them. So today, let's see just how much Raiden and Inazuma by extension shine eternal. This video is also going to contain spoilers for the Inazuma Archon quest as a whole, uh, both Raiden story quests and also the Sumeru Archon quest, so if you have not done any of that, do not watch this video. Please click out, I don't want to ruin it for you. It's well worth experiencing on your own. In Genshin, you take control of the Traveler and embark on a massive journey to find their lost sibling. To do this, you have to go through seven nations and meet with their respective gods known as Archons. On the second leg of their journey, the Geo Archon, Zhongli, informs the Traveler that there is some serious shit popping off in Inazuma, their next destination. For starters, the way to Inazuma is completely closed off to the player, surrounded by a big thunderstorm. This means that the Traveler can't go there freely, instead having to travel by boat. This is already a big contrast to the game's open-ended exploration to this point, where the player could go anywhere with almost no restrictions. Zhongli also tells the Traveler that the Raiden Shogun has gone scorched earth on her people. She's stealing people's visions to uphold her idea of eternity, her nation's unquestioned, unchallenged, and unchanging prosperity. This is a huge freaking deal. In Genshin Impact, a vision is believed to be a gift from the heavens and is the embodiment of the user's personal hopes and ambitions. And once those visions are taken from them, they're left as empty, ambitionless husks, like me after an 8-hour shift at work. To have a god forcibly take that from them was just not heard of up until this point. But everyone who challenged Raiden Shogun was to be eliminated. Oof. Talk about a rough deal. Zhongli isn't the only character with a lot to say about the Shogun. Shortly after, the Traveler meets Kazuha, an Inazuman who fled the nation. His best friend was fucking folded by the Raiden Shogun in a duel to the death. His friend Tomo tried to take a stand for his vision and paid the ultimate price. Kazuha then fled to fight another day, holding on to that vision. Both of these situations paint a very vivid picture for what the kind of person the Raiden Shogun is, and immediately plants all sorts of wild ideas in the player's head. If we believe these two characters, what kind of crazy shit is going to unfold in Inazuma? Character hearsay is the best way to build interest and excitement, and it's a technique that the devs at Hoyoverse use really well. Because Genshin is a live service game, new content is being created roughly every six weeks or so. The perk to this is that the devs are able to generate excitement and expectations for characters that haven't even been seen in the story or even revealed officially. Leaks and online buzz also go a long way too, but that's a legal can of worms I definitely don't want to open. Raiden isn't the only character to have this huge buildup, and I wanted to quickly touch on my king, Hayato. He's another character from Inazuma, and despite being a crazy important political figure, he had no face for about seven months after Inazuma was released. All we had to go on were character voice lines that hinted at his personality and his relationships. And when I say that Ayato was a fan favorite despite this, people loved him. 
There were dozens of fan designs and headcanons for a character we knew next to nothing about, so much so that people joked that he was going to be revealed as a horse. This excitement reached a fever pitch when he made a cameo in another character's teaser, and that was just his voice. My lord, look backstage! <laughs> yes, most entertaining. Pity that the Tenryu Commission has arrived. Ayato's cameo quickly overshadowed Ito's teaser and started to trend on social media sites. And once the time finally came to unveil him, he was met with almost universal fanfare. Ayato was a bit different than what people were expecting, but he's still popular to this day. Raiden herself is very popular in the community for a ton of reasons, and it shows. Her gacha banner is among the top selling in the game up until this point, and every single rerun following has been within that top five. In fact, this video took so long to make that at the time of this recording, Ayato and Raiden are both being rerun. Uh, the video will probably be out after this, but as of this moment, their banner cells are within that top five. If I'm not mistaken, it's at number one. And Raiden pretty handily dominates this top five, and you can see that people vote with their dollars here. Even if you don't play Genshin, there's no doubt that you've at least seen Raiden in one way or another, especially with her iconic burst. It's really clear that Hoyoverse is good at what they do, and goddamn, it works. On a personal note, I'm someone who gets easily honeypotted into anime or games if I see something that looks fun or interesting. I downloaded Genshin for two reasons. Yoimiya is really cute, and I needed to have her in the gacha. I would then be swiftly punished for my hubris. The second big reason is that I wanted to get to Inazuma. I wanted to spend some time talking about the nation itself before I got to the Raiden Shogun proper. Raiden herself embodies Inazuma, with her influence stretching far and wide, so much so that she's left a trail in almost every single explorable island. By the time I started Genshin, the update that introduced the nation had finally dropped. I saw and heard so much of Inazuma secondhand that I knew I needed to get there myself to experience it. Inazuma is so dangerous. I was not ready for that difficulty spike. I'm getting my cheeks clapped! was all I heard from my friends who got there. So naturally, I had all these expectations and feelings for what Inazuma would be like. To finally be there was this huge moment for me, and I was immediately hooked on the land's conflict. Getting off the boat, you are welcomed warmly by my homie Toma, but it's really clear that the air is thick with hostility. Inazuma's Sokoku decree is in full effect, meaning that unless you have official business in the country, you're not supposed to be there. Right in gatekeeping tourism must suck for the economy, by the way. Inazuma's police force, the Tenryo Commission, keeps a watchful eye on everyone who comes in and out, and everyone is afraid of attracting unwanted attention to themselves. You aren't even able to walk around without a travel permit, which, again, is insane to me. This is an open-world exploration game. But thankfully, we can catch the Tenryo Commission asleep at the wheel and slip out of the city to explore. Once Inazuma finally opened up to me, I put off as much of the story as I could, instead wanting to explore all of the islands in Inazuma. I feel like because of this I had a very unique experience where I had basically done all of Inazuma before I even met Raiden, and then I had all of these expectations for who she was before I even met her character. And it's through this exploration that I got to see Raiden's influence all around. My favorite example of this is at Yashiori Island, specifically Musojin Gorge. Raiden cleaved one of the islands in two after a fearsome battle against Orobashi, a giant snake, and the resulting fallout poisons this area. You can't even go inside this lake without it draining your HP. And Orobashi's skeleton is still here. Exploring all these islands gave me a pretty clear idea of what Inazuma was like. It's a nation that's embroiled in really fierce conflict, and it's still struggling to heal from the scars of yesterday. Raiden's pursuit of eternity has hurt a lot of people, and it's hard to justify her actions. But despite the constant suffering that clouds this nation, there is beauty to be found everywhere, especially in the environments. This contrast was very interesting to me, and it's one that hinted at the duality of things to come. Now that we've spent all this time going around Inazuma and hearing a lot about Raiden, we can actually go ahead and meet her and see how her actions shape the story in the Archon Quest. At some point in the story, you find out that one of your buddies has been arrested by the Tenryo Commission. In fact, he's the star of the Vision Hunt ceremony. Good for him! His vision is going to be the 100th one stolen, and the Big Cheese is going to commemorate that publicly. The Traveler arrives to put a stop to all this, but they didn't consider that the Shogun herself would be overseeing this milestone personally. Oh no. She's beautiful, and she's pissed. 
As an enemy of Eternity, you now have to face the Raiden Shogun herself, and this is the first time in the game you have to face an Archon. Alright, let's dance. She's every bit as formidable as you've heard. Raiden whizzes around the battlefield and overwhelms you with intense force. The pressure is almost too much to keep up with, and towards the end of the fight, Raiden enacts the Vision Hunt Decree on your party. She takes your visions and with that, your ability to fight. This is such a sick moment of Ludo narrative that caught me by surprise, and the only thing you're able to do after this is just run with your tail in between your legs. This fight is one of my favorite moments in Genshin because all of that buildup pays off here. Everything you saw and heard about Raiden is totally true. She is super imposing and very menacing and poses a tangible threat to the player. Raiden's first impression feels very earned because of that, even if it's an unwinnable scripted fight. It's no surprise though that the Electro Archon personally hands you an L. It's very embarrassing. <laughs> A lot happens in these next parts, which I won't go into too much detail with, it's very long. Now that we're wanted by the Shogun, we flee Narukami Island and turn to other Inazumans that are opposing the Vision Hunt Decree. This is the Resistance. They then face off against the Tenryo Commission in an all-out battle. We also learn of the Resistance soldiers who dream of having visions, even at the cost of their own lives. This part just goes to show how big the conflict is in Inazuma due to the Vision Hunt Decree and all of the casualties involved. Hell, there's even a lot of political collusion going on too. After after we help the resistance for a while, we get a tip that there's something funky going on in a factory. We meet the balladeer, who seems like a very nice, well-adjusted boy. Surely, he won't be important later. The Raiden Shogun's girl, familiar, rescues us from a pinch and also brings us a little closer to the truth. Oh no, she's beautiful. And she's sly. Yaimiko here's got a lot of info for us. She gave the Electronosis to the balladeer, which will be very important later on. But the most important thing that we learn from her is that the Raiden Shogun we met the day of the ceremony is not the real Raiden Shogun. That was a mechanical puppet that the real Raiden Shogun, named A, created. From now on in this video, I'll be referring to the puppet that we met first as the Shogun, and the real Raiden as A. A was the one who kicked our ass in that sick mind palace, the plane of Euthymia. In there, she's meditating to protect herself against erosion, which is mental decay that comes from living a long life like a god does. The Shogun herself was created with a single focus, to do anything and everything to ensure eternity. This made the Shogun an easy target for mustache twirling villains to manipulate her, that being two political factions in Inazuma, as well as the game's main antagonistic force, the Fatui. Speaking of the Fatui and political no-nos, the Shogun obliterates one of the main antagonists in cold blood. I'm talking nothing but ashes. Oops! Nothing says diplomacy has failed like assassinating a political diplomat. This section of the story has some of the most dizzying highs in Genshin Impact for me, and I think a lot of people agree. Kazuha parrying the move that killed his buddy with his vision is one that I hear a lot of praise about. After this, we go back into the plane of Euthymia and challenge A one more time. We're locked in a desperate clash with her, where we challenge her ambitions and everything she stands for. This time though, we're much stronger, much more capable, and have a feel for her power. This fight is incredible, and everyone in Inazuma's hopes and dreams rest on the Traveler defeating this immovable object. After we barely defeat A with everyone's help, this is where her truth is finally revealed to us. Long ago, there were two gods who ruled over Inazuma, twin sisters, two halves of the same coin. Makoto, the Electro Archon, was a gentlewoman who disliked fighting. Makoto believed that human ambition was the key to eternity and that there was beauty to be found in transience. Inazuma thrived under her rule and Makoto was loved by all. Her sister, A, lived in the shadow that her lightning cast. As Makoto's body double, A carried out all of her wet work. The Kagemusha was well versed in combat, spilling blood in the name of the Electro Archon. The citizens of Inazuma didn't know that A and Makoto were two different people. This is because they were both the Raiden Shogun by title, and frequently made public appearances as one person. 
500 years before the events of Genshin Impact, an ancient civilization known as Conria would be wiped off the map in an apocalyptic event known as the Cataclysm. This set the game's events in motion, and it would tear the Raiden sisters apart. Monsters from Conria came and attacked Inazuma, and Makoto went there alone to try and fight. A followed in pursuit, but was much too late, arriving right as she was taking her dying breaths. She lost her only family, and the Cataclysm would continue to selfishly take everything from her. All of Ace friends and loved ones died in the battle or shortly after. This left her with nothing but big shoes to fill, as she now had to take Makoto's place as the Electro Archon. A never asked for this, and she certainly wasn't fit to be a god in the same way that Makoto was. Despite that, she had no time to grieve. Inazuma had to continue moving forward, no matter what, so A came up with a plan. She would create a puppet to not just escape erosion, but also to govern Inazuma and hold her gnosis. We love women in STEM. A created her shogun prototype, but felt it was too human to carry out her impossible tasks. A let him go, choosing to let him live his own life. Surely you won't interpret this act of kindness as being abandoned, then join a group of morally dubious, much less swelling villains, only to ironically fulfill his original purpose by holding onto the Electronosis, then to ascend to false divinity with his mob's gnosis that can only be described as an affront to God, only to get his ass beat by us, right? That would be silly. <laughs> After A let the prototype wander, she created the Shogun, then sealed her consciousness within her. The Shogun would then become the face of the nation, carrying out what A believed to be eternity. Threats were to be eliminated without remorse, and A would begin to meditate indefinitely. Woo! Learning all this about A was a game changer for me, to say the least, but it made me adore her. Despite being a god, her sorrow, her loss, and her trauma made her so much more human to me. She lost everything and then had to move forward, and she handled that with the grace of an elephant on roller skates. A's pursuit of eternity has hurt a lot of people, and it's very hard to justify her actions. I don't think she made the best decisions for her nation at all, or even for herself, but to me this is what makes her so interesting. A was only used to being the sword in Makoto's scabbard, lacking the empathy and understanding that Makoto Makoto had. A had perceived Makoto's eternity as stasis, choosing to keep everything the same instead of letting everyone move forward. Her grief definitely played a very big part in that, and Inazuma felt that suffering. The nation couldn't heal or move forward until A did, and the storm surrounding Inazuma is emblematic of that. On a personal note, I rolled for Raiden on her first banner. I was interested in her kit, and I loved her design, so I decided to pull for her after driving home in a crazy thunderstorm. Almost died, but I guess A had graced me with her presence for surviving her trials. Alongside Barbara, Jean, and Yoimiya, Raiden was with me throughout my entire journey into that, all the way up until the battle with A. Learning all of this about Makoto and A changed my perspective on this character that's been in my party since the very start. In fact, I didn't realize this but I was playing as the Shogun the whole time. I only peeks out during her burst. She's the sword inside the Shogun, the Musoishin. Completing the Archon quest also lets you finally hear A's voice lines. And it was kind of surreal getting to see the sight of Raiden after being locked for hundreds of hours. I especially love how Anyako portrays the Shogun as an emotionless, albeit goofy robot with her cadence, and A as a cute mom with a sweet tooth. Foolish question. There are only two kinds of foods. Those that must be consumed to nourish the body, and those that harm it. Oh, don't listen to the Shogun. Desserts! Cavities are no big deal. You can just replace your teeth. Anyway, I just don't see how desserts can pose a serious obstacle to my pursuit of eternity. To me, A does have a warmth that is reminiscent of Makoto's. Which is funny, because they all share a voice actor. Learning all this, though, something finally dawned on me. All of these revelations set a very interesting precedent moving forward. So, we've been over this before. Genshin is really good at setting up player expectations through a ton of different means, and this is to build the narrative in the player's head. But how much of that information can we actually trust? Zhang Li and Kazuha both told the Traveler that the Raiden Shogun would stop at nothing to achieve her goals. But once we meet her, we find out that she's actually a woman so overcome with grief that she let herself become blinded by it. Now, generally, Genshin's storytelling should be taken with a grain of salt. It's full of unreliable narrators that 
for better or worse, push hearsay as truth, but I think there's a little more to this. Inazuma's Archon Quest sets a very important precedent. We can't trust what we hear. At least, not at face value. This is because there's a hierarchy of knowledge in Tevat. There are characters who don't know the whole truth, or can't say the whole truth. The true nature of Tevat and its mysteries is only known by few, and those characters aren't able to give that information to the player. Meaning that all information, regardless of its truth, is presented to the player completely unfiltered. This is still true in Sumeru's Archon Quest, which takes place long after the Inazuma arc. In it, the Sages of the Academia purposefully control the flow of knowledge through these Akasha terminals, and in these headsets, they're able to implant whatever they want, and the citizens don't question it at all. The result of this is all sorts of knowledge being spread around, regardless of whether or not it's true. The Archon Quest goes further into the manipulation of knowledge and what the consequences of that is, but that's an entirely different can of worms that's a bit out of the scope of this video. This is a very interesting meta-narrative, though, where information is manipulated not just through the characters and the lore, but also through marketing and social media. Hoyoverse is very careful in what they choose to post for each character, and they deliberately get people talking when they do. At the time of this recording, we have no clue who this is talking about Nahida. Another example is Klee's mother Alice, who we know is the most powerful witch in Tevat. We have never seen this character before, and here she is narrating the Wanderer's Kit overview. If you happen to run into this wanderer, don't let his menacing expression make you nervous. He Why? I'm losing my grip on reality. I have a confession to make, viewer. You can't even trust me at my own word. I mean, you can for all of this video. I was just withholding some information for the sake of my points. So I wasn't entirely truthful about two things. The first being that A slayed Orobashi for reasons that are far more complex than just suppressing a rebellion. Orobashi got a little too close to forbidden knowledge and then was sentenced to death by the heavens. The snake was told to stage a rebellion with his people to conceal this truth. A and Makoto only saw this at face value and A decided to just dice the dude up. The people of Watatsumi <laughs> aren't very pleased about this, but neither side really knows why Orobashi did this. The second thing I wasn't entirely truthful about is that Ayato isn't the person that people think he is. He's not evil by any means, but he's someone who wears many faces. A lot of people perceive him differently depending on what mask he decides to wear, and I think that he's a really interesting character because of that. Ayato is the dutiful head of the Kamisato clan, but he's also the guy who plays card games and bug battles with Ito. Even if Ito doesn't even know who he actually is. Nothing we see or hear in Genshin Impact can be completely trusted. Raiden's story is not the first time we've been presented with half-truths, but I think it marks a paradigm shift in the game's writing. Everything that's come out after these quests have been like this, and I find myself questioning what I hear constantly. The main story in Inazuma is over, and we now have access to A's optional story quests. It's kind of crazy these are optional, because these quests are so essential for fleshing out A and focus on what she does to move forward after the events of the story, which I feel that the main Inazuma quest kind of lacked, but it's good we get them here regardless. Because Genshin is a live service game, Reflection of Mortality, the first quest, was the only one that was available for a pretty long time, actually. I remember hearing a lot of negative things about it, and it kind of skewed my perception of it going in. I might be in the minority here, but I wasn't let down by it. But that's also because I think my experience was a lot different than everyone else's. By the time I got to this point, both story quests were out, so I was able to experience them back to back. And the benefit of hindsight helps me appreciate the first one more, so I have a lot I want to say about it. This first story quest is the first stepping stone for A, where she begins to make amends for her actions in the Archon quest. Reflection of Mortality starts with Inazuma's citizens saying that the Shogun is resting after your battle with her. Despite this, the thunderstorm surrounding Inazuma is starting to swirl a little out of control. We also hear that the Shogun is unable to handle any business, and because of this Inazuma's at a standstill. Rumors start to spread that she's sick, so her wife tells you to pay her a visit. We find the Shogun pacing at Tenchukaku, and she says she's not really able to do a whole lot right now. A pulls you into the plane of euthymia to explain what's going on. 
After your battle with her, A is taking some time to reflect on what she's done, and what her next move is. A shut off a lot of the Shogun's features in the meantime, so she's blue screening a bit. The Traveler recommends that A gets out of the plane Euthymia as a change of pace. She's been there for a couple centuries actually, and the Shogun's really been the only one to make public appearances in all this time, so getting out to see the current day Inazuma would do A a lot of good. What follows next is, well, a date with the Raiden Shogun. You visit the marketplace, you get some snacks, you read books, and take photos together. Even if this is a dream come true for me, I do understand why people don't like this part of the story quest. This ooting takes a little over half of the total quest runtime. Genshin does have this problem where it leans a little too much into fan service for its story and hangout quests, and it pigeonholes dates into what should be densely packed character stories, but even if this is a date with the Electro Archon, I think this is a necessary step that A needs to take. Inazuma has changed with time and A needs to go with it. With this in mind, the plot comes calling, and there's a bunch of political factions vying for power. We go with A to investigate rumors of political revolt, and help set the record straight. I like this part because we get to see A handle the political side of Inazuma, and settle it with a way that fits her character. She's not half bad at negotiating, but a duel will sort things out much faster. <laughs> with that taken care of, A reflects on the experience. Inazuma is always changing with the people who live there trying to do the best they can to move forward. She acknowledges that she too has made mistakes, and will change with the times, no matter how hard it'll be. This may mean that she has to tweak the Shogun to accommodate for this, but she's prepared to do that when the time comes. My favorite part of this story quest is how it mirrors both Raiden twins. The first half focuses on humanity and how precious the mundane is, focusing on all the transient beauty that Inazuma has and the second half is about conflict and political drama, and how icing someone really is the easiest solution. <laughs> Reflection of Mortality is a solid story quest. It's short, it's sweet, and it's filled with a lot of great character moments for A. She shines very brightly here, and we get to explore all of the sides of her we normally wouldn't get to see. This quest elevates the next one in very meaningful ways, as we'll see. Raiden Story Quest 2, Transient Dreams, is peak Genshin. <laughs> I think it's one of the game's best story quests released up until this point, and I still think it's the best quest to me. I had high expectations for this coming in, because everything I heard involving it was singing its praises, sort of the opposite of what I heard about the first one. And I think it delivers in every single way. It's tight, it's dense, and it's an emotional story that sees A confront her demons. It also helps wrap the Inazuma arc in a neat bow, Again, something I felt that the main Archon quest was lacking in. Transient Dreams begins with Rift Hounds attacking the roots of Inazuma's sacred Sakura tree. This mystical landmark is very important to Inazuma, so the Traveler is commissioned to take care of it. A swoops in to save us when she sees we're getting overwhelmed. She also says that the last Ooting has made her want to see the world more, but she's really here to investigate the attacks. These Rift Hounds actually bring back horrible memories. In fact, they were the front guard during the Cataclysm 500 years ago. This story quest forces A to confront her past, as a lot of it deals with her memories of the Cataclysm. We hear a lot about the Cataclysm firsthand from her, and we also get to see some of it too. The roots of the Sacred Sakura are able to hold the memories of those who died and manifest them into reality. Many of these specters were soldiers that bravely died in the battle, but my favorite encounter is with Furuyama, a blind tea master that served the Raiden Twins. He says that the Almighty Shogun described Inazuma to him in vivid detail, and he grew to love the romantic stories that she told. Her views on dreams brought him closure, despite not being able to experience any of these things in his life, and for that he had no reason to be afraid for what comes next. Obviously, he's talking about Makoto, and he remembers her as a dreamer at heart. This is the only other first-hand account we have of Makoto to my knowledge, and we can really tell that the people of Inazuma loved her. On the topic of Makoto though, A says something very interesting about her. Once A decided to pursue mat <laughs> maternity? <laughs> After her death, A decided to pursue eternity. She was able to save a bit of Makoto's realm of consciousness, her plane of Euthymia in a sense. Once she brought it back to Inazuma, the sacred Sakura appeared. The citizens claimed that it was always there, even before she left to Kanria, but that's a surprise tool that'll help us for later. As we press on and encounter more of these specters, the common denominator becomes clear. It's dreams. These dreams are what kept the fire in their hearts burning even when faced with absolute doom. The people of Inazuma placed their faith in the almighty Raiden Shogun up until the bitter end, 
A acknowledges their hopes and resolves to create a brighter tomorrow for Inazuma. I think she really needed to hear all this from her people, and I really do like how we get to see a warrior become more like a leader. A concludes that her grief has blinded her for too long, and that she's neglected her basic duty as an Archon. She's not Makoto, and she'll never be Makoto, but she still needs to do whatever she can to honor her legacy and her people. Change is not something to be feared, but we need it to move forward. I'm really proud of A here, and I think this is when she finally starts to understand Makoto's idea of eternity. We unfortunately don't have much time for group therapy though, because A's body is on the fritz. A says that the Shogun is calling. The puppet isn't letting her do what she wants anymore, but A says she's ready to face her. We venture into the realm of Makoto's consciousness, hidden in a cave underneath the Grand Narukami Shrine to face the Shogun. Because the Shogun is programmed to uphold the rules, she thinks A's new ideas pose a threat to eternity. But because they're both warriors, this can only be settled with a battle. A must now face herself, literally and figuratively, to test her resolve. Uh-oh, peak alert! Not only is this a great callback to the first battle, but the Shogun's got some new tricks up her sleeve. Another little touch I like is that A is fighting with Muso Ishin, the sword that she inherited from Makoto. The Shogun herself is fighting with Engulfing Lightning, the polearm that A was frequently seen with. The music here is also, oh my god, insane. Neither side's giving an inch, locking the two in a fierce battle. A tells you that this battle might take a little while, but she vows to her people that she'll come out of here victorious no matter how long that takes. She leaves everything in her wife's dubiously capable hands and sends you back to Inazuma. I can't believe that Yai's first reaction to all this news is to scold A for being a hard-headed moron. These two are unbelievably married. With Yai's help, we're able to find a way to A's side. I think it's very sweet and thematically appropriate that we have to focus on our heartfelt wishes to cross space-time and reach A again. Time passed in Inazuma as normal while A was here, but these two have been fighting for 500 years. A's will hasn't broken a single time, and she spent all of this time atoning for her sins. The Shogun is willing to put an end to this if A can prove to her one last time that her spirit is unbreakable. There's a line that Kazuha says that has stuck with me since I heard it. There will always be those who dare to brave the lightning's glow. It's important to his character arc, and it's always used when facing the Shogun. I don't want to take that quote away from him, as again it's important to his personal arc, but I think it's interesting that it can also apply to A. She carries her new dreams into this battle standing in defiance to the Shogun. These two separate moments stand parallel to each other, and I think a lot of people don't talk about this. This final duel is just as fierce as the last, but A comes out on top. This line is particularly raw. Yet, my reason for fighting redefined my martial prowess and redrew my limits. I now carry the gaze of the myriad of expectant eyes that look to the light in the heavens." The Shogun relents, saying that she'll become a shadow, and will help her achieve whatever it is that she decides to do. Transient Dreams has one last surprise though. Makoto's consciousness manifests from the Muso Ishin and speaks to A one last time. I got a little choked up here, I'm not gonna lie. We get to hear Makoto again, and we hear her apologize to A for leaving Inazuma in her hands. And we also get to see her tease her for being so hard-headed. It's very bittersweet. Despite her guilt for leaving everything to A, she knew that she would reach this point somehow. Makoto was proud of her twin sister, and the next cutscene is what drove me to tears. I almost cried again while rewatching the footage for the video. This frame right here has stayed with me for months after I finished this quest. Makoto's consciousness turns into a seed, and trusts that A is finally strong enough to plant it. Eternity extends time into infinity. Dreams illuminate each moment within. When both shine in unison, the sacred Sakura blooms from the darkness, finally free from the clutches of the heavenly principles. Now the nightmare has dissipated, and reality is made whole. The vision we both yearn for is still further ahead. My only regret is that I cannot witness Inazuma's future. Nor can I walk this journey with you. And this seed becomes Sacred Sakura, 
the symbol of not just Inazuma, but also the spirit of the Electro Archon. Makoto's realm of consciousness being preserved in Inazuma after the Cataclysm meant that through wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey means, the sacred Sakura tree had already existed. The seed just needed to be planted by the A of now and travel through time. Makoto finally disappears and entrusts Inazuma to A completely. No matter what comes next, Makoto believes that their shared vision will come into fruition. Goodbye, Makoto. The Sokoku Decree is lifted, and a new Inazuma is born. This rebirth brings new dreams for the future. And with this, Transient Dreams comes to a close. I think it's a fantastic way to close out the Inazuma storyline, and it gives a much needed closure. Both quests did this, but the second one brings it all home. There's one last story bit I wanted to touch on, an additional limited time event one actually. The Iridori Festival was an event that centered around Inazuma, and while the other two events bring it to a close, I think thematically this is the finale. Now that people can travel to Inazuma for leisure, the festival can now be held after all this time. It's a very big, bombastic celebration. It gives natives and outsiders a taste of Inazuma's history and its culture. Although, let's be real, it's basically just Kamiket. <laughs> people from all over Tavat visit, many of which are characters from the Traveler's Journey. Klee and Yoimiya write a storybook together, Albedo gets to paint murals for the events, and so on. A only appears once here, but this event is very big for her character. The Sokoku Decree being lifted means that A has finally opened herself up to change. Outsiders getting to enjoy Inazuma for what it is now is proof of that, and they're able to form friendships with people outside the country. Makoto adored Inazuma and its transient beauty, and I think A's acknowledgement of that in the previous quests is what allowed this event to even take place to begin with. Lastly, the Iridori Festival also sets up the Sumeru Archon quest, which is kind of crazy for a limited event. I think Hoyover should stop doing this. <laughs> Ayato tells the Traveler that the Balladeer was in Inazuma shortly after the Sokoku Decree ended. While he was looking for something regarding to the event story exclusively, it's a reminder that he's moving in the shadows. He is in possession of A's Electronosis, so there was no telling at this point what he'd do. Despite the Electro Archon taking a back seat after this, her presence is still very much felt in the Sumeru Archon quest. That's because the thematic precedents that she laid out in the Inazuma Archon quest are still being upheld, and she still feels like she's with us, especially when the Electro Gnosis is being used. But if I were to go further into this, it would slowly become a Wanderer character study and not a Raiden Shogun one. I had two conclusions for this video that I ended up scrapping because I wanted to kind of capture the raw feeling that I feel now that I am at the end of this project here and sort of capture my thoughts on not just the Raiden Shogun and Inazuma as a whole, but also my thoughts and feelings on this project. My time in Inazuma had finally come to an end and I just felt this wave of sadness kind of wash over me. I spent so much time playing this game every day, every night, uh, not just with myself, but also with my partner just trying to reach this point in the game. And once I finally got here, I just felt like Inazuma had delivered on so many of those expectations. And I think Raiden Shogun is very much to not blame, but I can attribute all of those feelings to her. I feel like she made this game so much better for me, and having written all of this in service to her, I feel like I appreciate her more as a character, and I just, I love A. She's the best. And again, I feel like like the thematic precedents that she has set for the story of Genshin Impact have been continuously upheld and carried all throughout like the Archon quests and also like the character story quests and all that. There's a lot that I still haven't seen or done regarding Inazuma and the character story quests that I didn't leave out but haven't experienced yet. I have a very strong feeling that Raiden, at least thematically, will be a part of these things. And again, Inazuma's story, while it wasn't the best in Genshin, it still had the highest highs for me. It was just filled with all of these intense moments, 
uh, these crazy moments that uh, I can't help but look back on and smile. And sure, a lot of characters got shafted, like poor Kujo Sara, I didn't even think I mentioned her by name in this video, <laughs> uh, didn't get her time in the limelight. But again, I do feel like things really only got up from here. All the characters and future story quests got their time in the sun. But again, I feel like this is kind of where the game stepped it all up, as it was the first biggest expansion that the game had. It had a lot to prove, a lot to live up to, and everything was delivered. And I feel so grateful having made it to the end of this journey, not just with the Inazuma story quest, but also with the video, because I have just a newfound appreciation for Genshin Impact and its writing. If you made it to the end of this video, thank you so much for your time and patience. I am eternally grateful. I know it was a super long one. <laughs> I kind of went out of my comfort zone for this video and I wanted to try out something new, maybe test out the writing chops for something a little more different. I still want to go back and do the stuff that I've been normally doing, but I know that this one was a little bit of a departure, so if you did like it, let me know in the comments. I want to keep trying new stuff out as I find my footing as a creator. So again, if you really did enjoy today's feature, please be sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe, other YouTube buzzwords, call to actions, etc. My socials are up top. So thank you so much, guys. I also want to extend another thank you to the artists I've worked with. Their socials are going to be up here below, but thank you, Belle, for the Mika GBs, and thank you, Zadora, for the Mika emotes you saw for the music cues. Super appreciate all of their work. Super appreciate everything they do for me. They are very talented artists, so please give them a follow. I want to extend a special thanks to the artist who worked on the thumbnail piece, Fire SD Art, of course, another piece, banger from them. Uh, Himawari as the Raiden Shogun. It's funny because she looks a lot like Yaimiko. <laughs> Might be getting a lot of that in the comments. I really like this piece a lot. All of the detailing goes crazy. The rendering is crazy. Everything crazy. <laughs> Genshin designs are very complicated and complex, so I think she really captured the essence of not just the channel mascot, but also the Raiden Shogun herself. So if you enjoyed the piece that's in the thumbnail and are now seeing it in its full glory, be sure to follow Fire SD Art for more bangers. Our socials are on screen now. And again, that's going to do it for me today, y'all. Have yourselves a good one. Take care, stay gold, and I'll see you next time.